So, uh, so the, the title, the headline of our presentation is Conformity is Not the Answer, It is the Enemy. And when you look at it in this context, it, it seems like a pretty obvious statement, right? Uh, but it's one of those things, like I know I, I certainly didn't always, uh, always feel that way. And I always tell people, like, my name was one of the reasons I became a designer. I grew up in, in Montgomery County um, and in the 70s. And as a kid, I remember just my, my name always stuck out like a sore thumb. I, I hated every part of it. These were all of my best friends from elementary school. And, and my name always just felt different and unusual. Uh, I went to the small Catholic elementary school in Montgomery County, and th this was my uniform. This was my, my world, uh, Mondays through, Monday through Friday, and this was the world and, and the universe I was most comfortable in. And I, I'm half Indian, and my mom would insist um, to showing up at school events once or twice a year and always insist on, on wearing her saris. And I remember as a kid, I, just, I, I thought we stood out like sore thumbs, and, and I hated every part of this experience, and it was, it was absolutely mortifying. Um, and then I discovered design, and I discovered design post-college, but it was a transformative idea for me. And at the core of it was this idea that design was all about embracing and celebrating the things that are unique. Those are the things that are memorable and motivating and effective. Uh, and I fell in love with that philosophy and, and became a designer. And one of the first things I learned along the way was like some of the basic core principles of design. So when you first start out in design, they teach you a handful of these principles, these guidelines around how elements come together and how to create interesting looking visual compositions. So there's principles around visual balance. There's principles around symmetry and alignment of objects. There's principles around movement in general, principles around rhythm, principles, design principles around unity. Uh, but far and away, my favorite principle was, was contrast. And contrast at its core is basically the ability to be strikingly different from, from your surroundings. And I really like that idea. And what we, we try to do with everything we create for clients in whatever space we're in, whether we're in the government contracting space or the legal space or the technology space or cyberspace, or professional services, what we see is this sea of similarity, like organizations in similar industries use a lot of the same visual cues and, and elements as they're crafting out their brand experiences. So from a contrast perspective, the first thing we try to think about is like, how do you create something that's strikingly different than everything else that's around it? But, but it's not enough to just be unique. Like being unique is, is, is great, but it's not, it's not in and of itself the outcome. So we always try to think about like, how do you create a brand experience that's unique? But then how do you create a brand experience that's smart? Like how do you create a brand experience that's, that's objectives driven, that either helps you solve a problem or, or create an opportunity? How do you create a brand experience that's scalable? Like how do you create a brand experience that can continue to grow and, and, and hit on various touch points and mediums and channels as they occur? And then finally, how do you create a brand experience that people just inherently feel? And I always think like one of the best underrated characteristics of good brands is they're just likable. Like before people know anything about them, their immediate instinctual reaction is a positive one. So how can you use contrast to help, help create that? So contrast in general as a, as a principle makes sense, but the challenge is the realities of how brands have to communicate. And a lot of it comes down to this, like whatever your brand is, whatever the construct is, Ultimately, this is the, the medium in which your, your, your brands are being consumed. So as you think about a brand experience, we always have to think, like, how does it scale down to this? The challenge with this is, obviously, as you get into, as you get into responsive design and all of, these various, uh, all of these various components, is you have to create an experience that is able to translate seamlessly across these mediums. And I always see these really tidy depictions of, oh, here's your mobile, and here's your desktop, and here's, here's your laptop view. But the reality is a lot more messier than that. There's just, and this, this grows by the day. So as we try to think about a brand experience, one of the things that I've realized is a lot of things have changed in the design industry as a result of responsive design. And it really has come down to the fact that content is being consumed in this, in this type of way. And when we look at it at its core, we have to think about, well, how do we create a brand experience that can be told effectively in the context of a rectangle? right in, in in the context of this shape sometimes this shape may be portrait sometimes depending on how somebody's holding their phone the shape may be landscape sometimes it may be small some sometimes it may be bigger but there's all of these variables and how brand content is being consumed which is what, what has led to this sort of proliferation of these really 
predictable design construct. So you see this pattern everywhere on every website, hero image at the top, subhead statement, some small supporting statements. And the problem with that is it, it's smart and it's effective from a development standpoint, but the challenge with that is it becomes incredibly difficult to differentiate yourself. And I see, we see so many variations of these things where, where people are telling their narratives through these very um, predictable and homogenous sort of uh, constructs. And they talk about we're this and we're that and we're this. But the reality is as soon as you put your brand in these really sort of predictable constructs, it just starts to look, feel, and sound like everybody else. Which then of course then begs the challenge of, how do you create, like, what goes in this space? Like, what do you put to, to, to stand out and then at a tactical level and then at a broader, more, more existential level, like, how do you stand apart as an organization? Like, what do you do from a brand perspective to make sure you're noticed and, and remembered? So the first thing we say is always lead with an idea. Like, and when we describe brands to clients, what we, the, the, the metaphor we always use is this pyramid. Like, this is your brand. And at the peak of it, at the apex of it, has to be a defining idea that provides structure and order for everything else that falls underneath of it. Once that idea has been established, then you can determine how that idea translates into a name and a brand position and messaging and voice and tone and, and visual identity. And then the layer well below that is how it actually translates into deliverables, websites, marketing materials, training, alignment, campaigns, and all of those components. But really at the core of it, that orienting idea, that key thought has to remain persistent throughout the, throughout the brand experience. And we're often then asked the question, well, what does an idea look like? Like what, what's the form? What's the shape that an idea takes? And for me, this is one of the first brand ideas I ever remember seeing. I remember exactly where I was standing when I saw this poster for the first time. And it was such a transformative concept for me because I grew up again in, in the 70s. I was obsessed with personal computers. And I remember every single personal computer ad looked like this. It was about the machine. Look how smart this machine is. Look how much knowledge and information you can jam into this thing. And Apple took such a diametrically different approach. It wasn't about the machine. It was about what the machine allowed you to achieve. And this taught me that you don't always need to showcase your product in order to, to demonstrate your value. So this was, this was contrast in, in, in branding. Same thing here. This is, a, this is another one of my favorite ad concepts of all time. This is probably a 40-year-old ad concept. But you realize is they were able to transcend their product and service. It, it wasn't about the tires. It wasn't about the rubber. It wasn't about steel belted radials or any of those things. It was about what sits on top of your tires. What, do you, what does it represent? So this, this was contrast. It was thinking about your product and your service in a, in a uniquely different and, and a profoundly important way. And the list goes on, right? Uh, Starbucks, when I, grew, when I was growing up, um, coffee was something my, my parents drank and occasionally you picked it up at a gas station and Starbucks transformed the coffee, the idea of coffee into this luxurious experience that even had its, that even had its own vocabulary. And, and that was contrast in branding. And again, the list goes on. I always think this example, like somebody looked at the nest, somebody looked at a thermostat, this forgettable device that sat in somebody's co some corner of everybody's house and they reimagined it to be about like self-identity and self-expression. And, and, and that was contrast. So we, bring, we try to bring that philosophy into every brand we create. Um, and I wanted to give you a couple examples of what contrast looks like in, in, in action. So this is, a, this is a global law firm we worked with uh, a, a few years ago. We, we inherited their logo mark, we inherited their color, and we were being tasked with creating a brand identity for their global regulatory practice, which in and of itself, I think, had 900 plus attorneys. It was, it, it was fairly sizable. And as we were going throughout the process, the first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure we could create an idea around it, but we first had to understand like what's the space we're dealing with. So as we were going through the discovery process, we were learning more about the regulatory process and we were starting to hear terms thrown around describing the space. So we'd hear terms like, it's hugely complex. It's this tangled mesh of, of, of rules. It's these shifting standards. It's impossible to understand the space, let alone in advance in it. So we got the sense like it, it, it's a highly complex space that's, that's, that's wrought with challenges. And then we started going through and, and putting together a narrative around it. So what you're seeing here is I'm just clicking through a few slides to give you 
They said these are some of the, the, the brand messaging as we were presenting the brand. So we offer a depth of skill, range of experience, global perspective, but that's not what defined their practice. Those were not their differentiators. Their differentiator was really, they had this fundamentally different view of the regulatory space. It wasn't a force to be feared. It wasn't an obstacle to, be, uh, to, to overcome. It was simply a reality of doing business. And organizations that understood that reality and organizations that were able to navigate that reality were the ones that were gonna be able to advance. And we really liked that idea of being able to advance in the face of complexity. So we went back and revisited revisited the full title of the practice and what we realized is if you strip out the extraneous letters from it you can distill it down to a pretty simple concept so we came up with this brand idea around it of, of go which was designed to communicate basically momentum movement and, and action from a design perspective we wanted to create something that didn't feel like a, a, a law firm space we wanted to create something that communicated a sense of movement and momentum and then we wanted to create something that was international. They deal with clients all over the world. So we thought from a brand perspective, we've got this concept of go, this ability to move. Let's support it by this universal, by the usage of this sort of universal symbolism. So whether you're here in the States, whether you're in Beijing, whether you're in Brazil, we wanted to create an experience that was able to be universal, that was able to translate in different ways, both from a visual perspective and from a voice perspective. From a design perspective, we thought, let's make sure that's carried through in everything. So I'm just clicking through so you can get a sense of some of the, the, the visual vocabulary around the brand. But we inherited green as part of their logo mark, and we realized, why not just take that one step further? We have this concept of go. Green is a color that's suggestive of movement um, and activity. So let's make that a persistent part of the brand experience. So every single image in, across the entire brand identity utilizes green in some capacity. So then it can start to translate. Then you can think about like, how does that idea and how does that concept start to translate into their digital experiences? How does that design start to translate into their, into their printed experiences? So they printed these up in about a half dozen different, different languages. How does the rest of the look and feel, you're seeing collateral, how does the rest of the look and feel then continue to, to extend out the brand and continue to sort of reinforce the, the visual look and feel around it. As it gets more and more tactical, how does it then start to translate into things like white papers? So obviously like the use of green can be a great unifying element, but beyond that, how can we create typography constructs that allow for flexible amounts of information and still, uh, still adhere to a, a visual consistency? And so it translates into everything, that, that design perspective. And from a brand perspective, this is one of the key litmus tests. It's like, how do things translate into this type of context? Like, are you creating a look and feel that can scale down into, into mobile devices? And then how can it translate across other types of mediums? So what you're seeing here is how it starts to translate in email and how, again, that use of green can become this orienting element throughout the brand experience. So I'm just clicking through so you can get a sense of how that can translate. But I always use this as a good example. Like this is their, this was their immigration practice. And this to me is always an opportunity. If you can't capture something using conventional photography in an effective way, this is where like metaphor can come in and you can use it as a way to reinforce and capture interesting ideas and concepts. Then after that, we break it down. And I think we, we tell our clients that brand is an exercise in purpose first and then consistency second. So we try to create frameworks around it. So if we're gonna say that this is who we are as an organization or this is who we are as a practice, let's break it down into very tactical things. Let's break it down into sound bites. Let's break it down into conversation starters. If we're gonna have this idea of go leading our brand efforts, let's make sure we really clearly define it in a way so that every single attorney within the firm can repeat the brand narrative and repeat the key ideas of the brand in a consistent and, uh, and powerful way. And it translates into everything. Again, purpose and consistency. So if we're gonna create a brand experience that's built around the use of the color uh, green to suggest movement and momentum, Let's make sure we define exactly how to choose those images. And this is, again, as you think about a brand long term, how do you create an experience that can scale? So green being the photography, how do you pull images from the spectrum? Like, what are the considerations there? So I'm just clicking through to give you a couple examples of like how that translated into a photography library. 
where an entire design system, and it gets pretty tactical down to specific concepts or specific ideas and how photography can be used to help capture and reinforce that ideas. So it scales down into their various practices. It scales down into their sub practices. And then ultimately, it scales down into how they think and operate as an organization so, or as a firm. This is one of their partners in, in Bora Bora. And for us, this is the opportunity when a brand transcends the product or service um, and becomes part of a bigger idea. So they have their attorneys submitting photos from themselves all over the world in, in a state of go. And that's how we try to think about a brand experience. Like how can we create something that transcends the, the product and, and the service? So the number one is you start with an idea. You have to have an idea. But then after that, the, the challenge becomes, how do you best own your identity? Like, how do you best capture and express the idea that you have in a way that feels visually consistent? And people often ask us, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean to, to own your visual identity? And what we go through from a brand perspective, there's a number, a handful of brand signals that define a brand visual. There's, there's color, there's shapes and patterns, there's typography, imagery and image choices and then there's composition like how all those various pieces come together and when those pieces come together in consistent ways the results can be very powerful like you look at this and it's like that's clearly Reese's right but there's thousands of companies out there that make confectionaries that make peanut butter cups but Reese's has done such a masterful job of consistently applying the same brand signals over and over again the same design composition the same use of color the same typography constructs, the same use of voice, consistency in how they apply it, so that you don't need enough, you don't need more context around it to, to recognize the brand experience. Same thing again here, like this is, this is clearly McDonald's, um, and McDonald's has done such a masterful job of using red as that core brand signal. And you realize like when you look at fast food companies, they all use red, like they all use red in some capacity, but McDonald's has been able to own that color because of how they've applied it and how they've used it consistently over and, and over again. And as you pick your signals, as you pick your colors and your shape and your typography, the opportunity is to always make sure that your signals are an accurate reflection of your message. So this is, this is Dunkin' Donuts, and Dunkin' Donuts has rebranded several times, I think very effectively. But when they did their first major rebrand about 10 years ago, they were facing stiff market competition from, from Starbucks. And you realize they could have taken their brand in a few different ways. They could have tried to sort of out luxury Starbucks, uh, but instead they didn't. They decided to double down on their roots as a fun, fast, friendly place to get a cup of coffee. And every one of their brand signals, their colors, their typography constructs, every one of their brand signals is designed to reinforce that, that idea. And those signals matter, right? You look at this guy or this, this woman, and she has to be yellow, right? Yellow is a color that's full of positive associations. It's optimistic. It's, it's whimsical. When you start changing the signals around a brand, you don't have to change many of them to start changing the overall meaning. And you can create a lot of cognitive dissonance if there is a lack of consistency between the message you're communicating and the signals you want to get across. Um, and it's very easy to confuse audiences if your signals sort of contradict the overall message, the, the message of the brand. And when, as we go through, when in, in design school, they teach you all of these different things. There's over 20 different parts to a letter form and characteristics of individual letters. And all of these are factors. And chances are buying audiences don't care, right? They don't care if you're using this serif or this serif or this color or this color. But that doesn't mean that they're not responding to the experience. And a goal from a brand perspective is to create an experience that elicits an immediate positive reaction without people necessarily knowing why they're reacting that way. It needs to be balanced with substance and depth and detail and all of those, those, those key considerations. But we wanna create something from a brand perspective that immediately strikes the right type of uh, emotional chords. So once you have your idea and once you have the signals you use, then the opportunity is to make it as flexible as, as possible. So this is a brand we're working on. This is a government contracting organization that does a lot of uh, big sort of technology services in the federal space. And we're rebranding them. And one of the things we realized is let's create a mark around it. So this is Bixel. We create this mark. And I think one of the first questions we ask when creating a logo is like, how flexible is it? Like how many different ways can you use it? So we have this construct, and the first thing we realize is we can play with this B, 
and we can do different things with it. You can just immediately apply it on top of photography and you can play with scale and color and proportions and positioning and you can immediately apply this, this ownable stamp to, to the brand. So then we started putting it through its paces a little bit and we realized, well, we can also use it in a number of different ways. We can use it as a masking element. So we can use it in another way to tell the story. And we can mask out beyond just people. We can mask out like the services and the industries in which we specialize in. So we like this construct and now I'm moving through some of the creative, but we like this idea of this mark that we can use in a number of different ways. So how that mark can then start to translate into, into interactive experiences. Um, and how we can then again use like uh, metaphors as ways to capture and reinforce concepts. So if we're talking about our ability to be agile, let's make sure we can visually express that. Or if we talk about our, our commitment to diversity, let's look for opportunities to visually express that as well through our imagery. So then that can translate into a lot of different things. It can translate into internal signage. It can translate into trade show booths and other types of, um, other types of uh, marketing materials. Beyond that, we look for opportunities with brands. It's like distill a brand down. I mentioned earlier messaging themes. We try to distill a brand down to a repeatable number of messaging themes. So for them, we came up with these eight defining themes around why it is, or why it is they do what they do and how it is they do it. And so from a brand perspective, the opportunity is to not just communicate these are the defining ideas that, that, that or these are the ideas that define our organization, but bring that into the brand, like brand everything around the organization, like brand these, these core themes around how they communicate and how they operate and how, what they value. So what you're seeing here is a number of these supporting themes around the brand and how they can work into the visual vocabulary that, is, that has been established for the brand and then how that can translate into everything, how we can then take those, those ideas and those messages and those themes and translate into their website, translate it into their internal communication efforts, translate them into their onboarding materials and in their sales materials, but looking for an opportunity to elevate the message beyond their products and services and really define like what it is they value and, and how they operate. So I'm just clicking through. So beyond that, this is where it really gets interesting. From a brand perspective, you get this, you have this mark and you can use it in a number of different ways. So what you're seeing here is a, a, a hypothetical example of how that brand then can translate it into external materials, how it can translate into a potential proposal for a client. So how we can, how this organization can put their stamp of ownability in a number of different ways. And going along the lines of purpose and consistency, one of the key things is if you're creating something like this is making sure that there's very definitive rules for how it's used and how it's applied. What you're seeing here is a couple snapshot representations in the brand guidelines for how that mark element can work and the number of different types of, of permutations. And again, all of this stuff gets pretty tactical, but the key is with all of these things from a brand perspective, a lot of times we see with brands is they fall apart by death by a thousand cuts, like a little bit off here, a little bit off here, a little bit off here, and all of a sudden the overall brand vision and look and feel has been compromised. So as you go through and think about these rules and considerations, is putting as much guidance and rationale around them. So as people are continuing to push out materials, making sure that the brand retains its overall visual integrity and structure. And then it can translate into a number of different things. So that look and feel and the use of that mark can translate down to things like social headers and, and posts and how we can create these pretty interesting textures with nothing more than just photography and the use of this, uh, and the use of this symbol mark. So I'm just clicking through so you can get some examples of how it translates. But then beyond that, like what else can we do with it? So they had these six core services. So we've got the signature mark and then we can create additional permutations of this mark to speak directly to their various service line offerings. So again, the opportunity to make the mark flexible and it can be used in a lot of different ways. So then it can be used to specifically market a sub-level of service, but that still ties back to the overall ma master brand e experience. And there's no consideration too small. Like from a design perspective, one of the things this organization wanted to communicate and reinforce is they're bringing people from all over the world, people with different backgrounds, different languages, different perspectives and, and different life experiences. So from a brand perspective, the opportunities, make sure we capture that. And that can be captured in a couple different ways. It can be captured 
through the use of these like narrative techniques for these various greetings in different languages, but it can be reinforced by the prismatic nature of the brand. So this brand has to be colorful because that's exactly what this organization sees and, and represents. So then we just start to look at like, how does it come together as a system? Like how do the various elements work, to, work together? And how does it translate into everything? Like uh, I always look at digital ads as like a great litmus test in a very confined amount of space. Is there enough ownability in your brand elements? Is there enough consistency in your brand elements that you can have a recognizable look and feel? And the permutations are endless. Then you can start to think about like how that brand mark can translate into even other things. So how they can use that brand mark to talk about their, their internal operating ethos and some of the things they do um, to help ensure collaboration and alignment as they work and how that mark can then extend out in so many different ways to tell so many different messages and stories. So now I'm just clicking through so you can get a sense of how that can translate in different ways. And sometimes it doesn't have to be super heavy. Like sometimes it can just be uh, light design treatments. Um, but the opportunity again here is like, how can we create something that elicits a positive reaction and elevates the organization beyond the, the delivery of their, their product and, and their services. Um, so then number four is challenge conventions. And again, when we're in certain spaces, especially in the technology space and the cyberspace, that's where we see more often than not that sea of similarity, these consistent conventions that are applied over and over again. And a lot of times they're, they're not the right solution. Like we, we look at like cybersecurity, for example, we were doing a cybersecurity brand a few years ago. And one of our first activities when we're kicking off a new brand is like, Let's just take a look at like what the space looks like. Like what happens when you just Google the word cybersecurity? Um, so we tried and this is what you see. Like you see a sea of things like this. You see these enormously complex visual expressions of ideas and, and hooded figures and binary code and, and fingerprints and on DNA strands and all of these different, I, these different concepts. And what you realize is you're, you're, we're running into the limits of conventional photography. Like there's certain topics and there's certain subjects that can't be captured in conventional ways. So rather than, rather than attempt to do that, let's create a new metaphor around it. So for this particular organization, cybersecurity organization we were working with, they do credentials monitoring software to keep people out of the dark web. And dark web kept coming up over and over and over again. So in our mind's eye, we just tried to picture like, what does it actually look like? Like what, what form would it take and what shape would it take? Um, and what we realized is it, it wasn't hooded figures and binary code. It wasn't any of those things to us. It was this object. It was this thing that had no structure to it, no integrity. It was this mysterious object. You, you reach out to grab it and, and it's not even there. And we thought like, let's use this as the symbol for, for the dark web, this, this mysterious thing that, that nobody fully understands. From a brand perspective, we had inherited this hexagon as, as part of our mark. We had inherited this shape, this core brand signal. And we realized like, what if we take that shape, superimpose it on our depiction of what the dark web feels like, and then superimpose our messaging on top of it. So we go into the dark web to keep you out of it. So we have this signature brand element that we can use in a number of different ways. So from a marketing perspective, it can be used in, in digital applications. It can translate down to it can translate down to print. The look and feel can translate out in other different ways, and the use of color can be a can be a defining element of the brand. And for us, like one of the first litmus tests is like, are we creating something that feels unique in the space? Like, are we creating something that feels different and that and that people notice? And then beyond that, just looking for every micro opportunity we can to stand out and tell messages and stories in different ways. So what you're seeing here is we learned throughout the course of the process that the password system is inherently flawed. It's, 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 it's incredibly porous. So we realized from a brand perspective, let's try and capture that. Like, let's try and capture that concept and that idea in, in a more visually rich way. They were talking specifically about their software and their software's ability to see, their software's ability to respond, and their software's ability to succeed and basically scale at an enterprise level. So from a design perspective, broadening out the visual vocabulary of the brand and introducing these new elements that give us opportunities or give the client opportunities to speak about their value proposition in more memorable and, and, and visually engaging ways. And again, it can translate into any different types of things down from big things to you know, big brand concepts down to digital ads. 
down to even things like coffee cups. And again, small example, but the opportunity is you create brand elements is like, how can we create something that, how can we create something that embodies what we, what we do? And how can we create something that really stands out in, in the space? For it? So quick, uh, brief recap. Um, at, at, a, at a very high level, we, we try to avoid conformity. I think it's in, in this sea of similarity and these things we see, we try to create brand experiences and we, we always advocate for brand experiences that first and foremost can, can stand out, um, but that's not necessarily an easy thing. So the key things to do as you're thinking about how a brand can translate in different ways is always make sure you're leading with a core idea, a really powerful orienting thought um, once you have that thought established, make sure your visual identity is an accurate reflection of what it is you're trying to communicate. Always make sure that the visual identity that you've established is flexible and can be used in a number of different ways and can be as, as channels and platforms and mediums continue to grow and evolve. Always making sure that the visual identity can scale out in those different ways. Um, and then always questioning conventions, like always looking at the, the spaces that you're in and looking for opportunities to define the, 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 the traditional thinking and approach, it, and approach your brand from a, from a really unique and, and elevated perspective. Um, and then lastly, just kind of aim high. And I always use this, I, th I think Bruce Lee had the, had the best quote on branding ever, which is essentially some, some targets are only meant to be aimed at. And as you think about your brand, that's always the way we look at it is that you don't create the brand for the organization you are today. You create the brand for the organization that you're evolving into and the organization you're aiming to become. And that it has to be, it has to be honest. It has to be an honest and authentic reflection of who you are. But it also has to be aspirational in nature. It has to be out there a little bit beyond your, beyond your current reach. And that's usually the space where brands get really interesting and memorable and, and unique. So uh, thank you again for, for, for taking the time to, to, to listen in. Um, I'm happy to open it up to answer any questions you may have at, at this point, or, or Ken or Rena, if you, if you want to jump in, let me know as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Dharma. That was uh, fantastic. A lot of information to unpack. Um, so everybody that's on the uh, webinar, there's a Q&A button uh, at the bottom that you can go ahead and, and ask some questions. Some are already in. Um, so the first question was actually whether or not a copy of the PowerPoint will be provided so concepts can be shared. Uh, Rena answered it, but I am going to answer it on the, um, the webinar as well. Um, AAC members will actually receive the slides and recordings first, and then we'll, we'll open it up after our own members see it. So everybody will um, get the materials and be able to access the uh, recording, um, but AAC members get it first. Rena, did you want to say anything before I got into the Q&A? No, you got it. I mean, I have a ton of questions myself. Dharma, I'm ready to start calling you right this minute. What an inspirational presentation, but let, let's do the audience questions first, and then I have a few follow-ups as well. Sure, absolutely. Okay. So first question is, how do you think this approach applies or doesn't to nonprofits? I think the, the exact same approach applies sort of ac across the board. I think with, with anything, we always tell our clients, like a, a brand, uh, like I'm a designer and I'm as neurotic as they come and we always want things to look beautiful. But at, at its core, a brand is a way to solve a problem and, or create an opportunity or, or both. So whether you're in the nonprofit space, whether you're in the government contracting space, whether you're in the commercial space, I think a lot of the overall principles apply for all of these things. It's like, how do you get somebody to feel something? How do you get somebody to understand something? And how do you get somebody to remember something? So I think from that perspective, really a lot of the philosophies translate across, regardless of the, the, the space that you're coming from. Okay. Um... If I wanted to differentiate my business to distinguish our brand from competitors, what would be the next step and how would we work with your company? What is the average cost range? So two questions there. So to, to differentiate, I think it's a sort of a broader conversation, but to differentiate in general, the first thing you have to do is see the landscape and get a sense of like, what do the competitors look like? What do they sound like? What signals are they using? What are their key messages? What are their secondary messages? What are the other elements they're working with from a brand perspective? So typically speaking, when we kick off a discovery project as part of that 
process, we'll go through and we'll cover an entire wall with competitors and just get a sense of the landscape. Then we'll start going through and seeing like, okay, overall the competitive space tends to gravitate towards these types of messages or these types of visual, visual cues. So the first step is kind of seeing the space to make sure that you are truly creating something unique. Um, and then the second step is just making sure that you are creating something that's an honest and accurate reflection of the organization and, and where they're, they're aspiring to go. Um, from a cost perspective, there's all sorts of variables in there. Um, we do the, at the small end of the range, um, they start around 35K and then they can go up to, they can go up to uh, 200K depending on the size and complexity and how many pieces we create after it. Um, but typically speaking, we're, as you create the brand, one of the key things we try to do is make sure that you're creating a system behind that so that long after our engagements are complete, the brand continues to retain its, its overall look and feel. But there's a lot of variables to, to the actual pricing, and I could get specific details, but I'd have to probably know a little bit more about the, the organization, the space, and, and what it is you're looking to accomplish. Okay, next one. Uh, many government contractors have to go to orals or do presentations to potential customers. Uh, what strategies would you have for us as far as differentiating brand and presentations and or even people uh, presenting? Are there, are there techniques you use there to make presentations memorable? Yeah, absolutely. I think in general, the, the main thing is making sure if, if you've created this brand experience, like making sure everybody within the organization that's, that's, that's representing it fully understands it. And not just that, like, this is how who we are and, and this is what we look like, but understanding like the rationale behind everything. So making sure that people within the organization, if you're getting up and presenting, knowing, like knowing the brand inside and out, like knowing like what the, the key talking points and knowing as you're walking through elements of the brand, like what does that represent? How does that like articulate or capture or define a value of the organization? But making sure that people sort of inherently feel and understand the brand, I think is always the first key. So as we go through brand exercises, one of the first things we'll say is like, once the brand has been built, is like onboard your employees with it in a really effective way. And brands don't usually fail because people don't understand the rules around them. They fail because people don't understand the intentionality behind them. So bringing people internally, helping them understand the brand at a tactical level. Like if, let's say, for example, like your brand is purple, like make sure people understand, like what does that purple represent? What does it mean and how is that a reflection of your organization? So providing people with as many tools and resources as they can to ensure that that narrative and that explanation and that presentation is consistent. So that when I was showing you those examples of the, the messaging frameworks, that's where it gets really specific. But I think like the more you can ensure consistency in the words people use and the way people describe things, the more you can create that consistency in the messaging around the brand, the more powerful the brand experience becomes and the more translatable I think the brand becomes as well. Ken, I'm, I'm going to jump in here for a sure. second. And, and Dharma, it's what, what you just said is so important. It's, you know, the intent behind every element of your brand and your employees understanding that is so critical, so critical. Um, we work with a lot of uh, government contractors and when some of the, you know, when we first onboard our new clients, one of the questions we ask them is, what's your elevator pitch? Um, you know, we look at some of the logos, we are trying to design their, or build a proposal and put that logo in there and we're going, oh my God, what is this? You know, how do we get this thing in here? Uh, so even, even for government contractors to understand that it has become too um, similar and how do you differentiate yourself one of the points that you made in your presentation that I absolutely loved is the 10 word, 40 word, 100 words. How do you describe your company and having every employee understand that? Can you tell us a little bit more about how you go about the, that exercise, the quote unquote elevator pitch uh, does, coming up with that for the companies? Yeah, absolutely. So it's an exercise really in, in ruthless prioritization. Because you go through, we'll go through the discovery process, and in, depending on who we talk to and how many people we talk to, we can end, we end up with just reams and reams and reams of information. So I think the first thing is thinking about, like, as you go through it and as you're trying to understand your brand, is 
being able to first and foremost distill it down to a number of themes, like take a bunch of, you know, hundreds of ideas, distill it down to a handful of core repeatable themes first to provide some sort of framework around your messaging. But more often than not, that, that elevator pitch and that signature brand idea, it just comes through as part of the discovery process. We'll hear somebody say something, a specific turn of phrase or a specific wording that they'll use and one of us on our team will just hear it and like, that's it. There's, the, there's the, the concept around it. And then after that, it just like you have to go through and continue to trim away the, the excess. And it's a really difficult process. I think um, Mark Twain's quote, like, I would have written you a shorter letter if I'd only had the time, I think is very much applicable. I think like that from a, there's always the tendency to want to make sure we say everything and make sure we include this and make sure we include that. And I think from a brand perspective, there's always that opportunity. But the goal of a brand, first and foremost, I think is like, it has to make the complex comprehensible. Like people need to see it and wrap their head around the value proposition of an organization instantly. So I think we try to look at it as like, how do we create a brand experience, either from a messaging standpoint or from a visual standpoint that offers the illusion of simplicity, that people can wrap their head around it really, really quickly. And then just how do we then make sure that it's supported with enough substance, depth, and detail to tell the full narrative. Yeah, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there is the fear of giving up words. What if I'm not saying everything that the customer wants to hear? We hear that a lot from government contractors and I come from that world, so I keep harping on that, but we try to tell them, what do you want your company to be known for? Doesn't mean you don't offer all the other services, but do, what do you want to be known for? And it's that fear of, am I not including enough information that then becomes too much information for a client to digest? There, there is that balance for sure. But I think it's in, it, part of it is like having the confidence to know exactly what, what makes you different and what makes you unique and, and sort of doubling down on that. But I always look at some brand experiences and some sites and things we interact with where they didn't go through that pruning process and everything's there and it just at first glance it just looks stressful and i think again with a brand it's like the first goal is to get somebody to feel something because people will feel a brand far before they understand it so get somebody to feel something and i think the key to that is keeping it pretty elevated and then underneath of it you have like with between websites and marketing materials and other types of channels you have lots of opportunities to get into really nuanced detail around service offerings or platforms or products but really that defining idea shouldn't be limiting in any way. And the more detail you put around that core defining idea, the smaller I think the organization becomes. Yeah. Ken, yeah, over I, to you. Yeah, I, I was just going to, I mean, now that I was going to jump in on that. I know, you know, Rena, it was interesting that you brought it up because I, I keep forgetting where everybody's from, but, you know, Proposal Helper obviously does a ton of proposals and that brand element even on our proposal I, re I remember distinctly having gone through some things or whatever where you know we were producing proposals and and one of our people was working with another company and we're like oh wait what do you mean you're not gonna brand your cover you know what i mean what what do you mean you're not going to have a custom cover for this this particular proposal right and it's, it's something as simple as that that will just differentiate you you know what i mean from all your competition that just have like oh well government asked for this on the cover so you know, logo, name, from, to, solicitation, right? No imagery, you know. So um, th those things can make a difference. All right, jump in this. Sorry, go ahead, Dharma. No, I, I agree 100%. And I always use the example of the, the iPhone, right? You, you spend, I don't know how much iPhones cost now, but they, they cost a fortune. But the experience doesn't, the, the, experience, the experience starts with way before the actual product itself. Like even with the box, like the texture of the box, the way the box opens up, everything about that iPhone experience is designed to reinforce the value of the experience. So whether it's like the, the box of a product or the cover of a proposal, there's every little touch point in a brand experience is an opportunity to, to differentiate yourself and, and, and reinforce what it is you do. So I think like those tiny details can make, can make a huge difference, but that's really all the more reason why when you're thinking about it from that perspective, it's like, how does the brand translate into those different ways? And how can you create systems around things like that that become really repeatable? I think the thing you want to always try to avoid is creating custom one-off things that don't that don't add efficiencies to the process overall. So as you're thinking about like customizing proposal covers or business development pitches or what have you, the opportunities to look at it, how do you think about it from a systems perspective and how do you create a scalable experience 
that still maintains customization, but that also does not become enormously stressful and, and time consuming to produce on a recurring basis. Cool. Um, we have a bunch more to go through, but so we won't get through them all, but <laughs> let me ask a couple more. What is, has what is changed due to the COVID pandemic? Are there trends that you're seeing there and any strategies again stand out in this more and more digital virtual world? Um, <laughs> I think everyone's still trying to figure out what's, what's happening and, and where this is all going. Obviously digital, for, for sure. I think um, digital, in terms of the stuff we're producing now, it's like before, before COVID, it was still heavily digital, but there was still a, a traditional print component to what we were doing. It, I would say that that balance has shifted very heavily, obviously, towards digital. But like, yeah, then even thinking through, like, if, you are, if your brand is switching over to digital and things that, you know, presentations in the past that were handled in person are now being virtual or now you're having webinars versus like in-person presentations. So the opportunity is from a digital perspective is how does that brand experience remain consistent regardless of the platform or regardless of the channel in which it's being communicated. Um, so I think from, from, a, from a brand perspective, that's been that that's been a trend that's been happening for years and I think COVID is, has obviously um, certainly accelerated that but from an internal like from an operating perspective it's just like getting you know switching workflows and understanding like how these things can be created virtually uh, for us it's like one of the biggest challenges is we've been going through we've never done discovery virtually before or never presented brands virtually prior to COVID so you lose some of it. Like you have the you lose the opportunity to be in the room and, and kind of hear firsthand some things. Um, but we're, uh, but I think with everything, it's like with with the space that we're in now, it's like it's continuing to change. And for if nothing else, it's just reinforced like the importance whether you're in the agency space, whether you're in the government contracting space. For us, it's just reinforced. You have to have the ability to kind of change on a dime. Like however you've operated in the past, whatever that is, um, it doesn't matter. It's like the world around us has changed and brands need to be, and organizations need to be able to adapt to the current realities, whatever, whatever form those realities take. Gotcha. Uh, what are the biggest challenges in getting buy-in internally on rebranding efforts? A lot. Uh, the biggest one, I think, at the very top, I would say, is a lack of alignment in terms of where an organization is and, and where they're going. Because if you have differing views on what an organization is and what it represents and, and what, it, what its value is, it then becomes incredibly difficult to distill it down to, to one core idea. So I think the biggest challenge is, is, is not a creative challenge as much as it is sort of an operational one. Uh, but beyond that, I think it's, it's really key to um, to bring people into the thought process as, mu as much as possible and help understand the thinking behind the brand. And I think for the, the best bit of advice I, I was ever given in this field years ago by an awesome mentor was you always have to sell the thinking, never, never sell your work. Um, and what you want it to be is like, if you can sell the thinking, like we are changing our brand because of this, or our colors are this, or our typography is this, or our look and feel is being changed because of this. But being able, again, to, to like make sure people understand the thought processes behind everything usually gets rid of a lot of the subjectivity that often happens in the brand process. Beyond that, it's just making it a participatory process and making sure that different people's inputs and, and feedback and everything is heard. I think you want people to see, like when you see, they see their brand, they have to see their thumbprint on it. They have to see like, in some way, whether in a subtle way or in a profound way, they were able, their voice and their ideas were able to shape the direction of the brand and, were, and, and are being reflected in the brand. So I think making sure people feel like they're part of the process, making sure people understand the thought process behind it, I think are absolutely key to, to keeping the process as, as smooth as possible. And then the biggest thing is making sure at, a, at the executive level, an organization is aligned in terms of who they are and where they want to go. I'm going to jump in on that one just a little bit, Ken. Sure. How often, Dharma, do you think an organization should consider rebranding? How, what, it, when do you, how do you know when it's it's time for a change that you've been you're outdated now? Um, so, the, I don't think I can throw out an arbitrary date like every three years or five years because I, I think there's too many variables there. I think the way we the way we look at it is you never want to look at your brand as like inherently good or bad. It's just, what are you trying to communicate as an organization? What are you trying to accomplish as an organization? And then does your brand accurately reflect and, and support those objectives or does it contradict them? But I think that's the first litmus test is like just looking at it as, 
does the brand currently do what we needed to do? Does it solve the problems we're having? Does it create the opportunities we're seeking? That should be the question. And then based on the responses to that, then you can then go back and look at the brand and determine like, does it need, it, does it need to be updated? So I think, um, I think from that perspective, it's just making sure if the brand is no longer an accurate reflection of the organization or where they want to go, that I think is obviously time to, to, to consider branding. Or even at a more tactical level, like if the existing brand is just has all sorts of complexities and it's too hard to work with, and there's too many elements or not enough elements, like if at a functional level, if it's not easy for a marketing team or creative team or a business development team to put together decks and all that, then it's probably time to change. But I think there's so many variables and so many questions we have. I think I'd have a hard time saying there's a specific finite amount of time. On the website side, I think that's different. Obviously technologies change and things get a little bit more dated. So I think like making sure like the foundational elements below the brand are a little bit more flexible and those probably change on a more recurring basis. But I think as far as overall brand, it really just is, I think it just comes down to, does the brand accomplish what you're seeking to, does the brand help drive the objectives of the organization forward? And that I think is the first litmus test to ask before ever considering even going down that road. Makes sense, thank you. All right, I'm gonna throw out one more and then we'll go to closing remarks. Again, Dharma's uh, information is down uh, at the bottom. Uh, please feel free to contact him or AACC if you need uh, any more information. Um, last one is, any tips on getting buy-in from executive management for spending money on a brand refinement, brand work, et cetera? As you stated, most people think they don't care, even though they are certainly affected by the experience. Um, so, so there's a couple ways to do it. I think the, the, the most important thing, though, is if, if you're presenting it at the organizational level, at the executive level, is, is really clearly, like as much as possible, articulating the objectives like what is this going to what is this going to accomplish and then trying as much as possible to define as many supporting metrics as you can around that so if one of the goals of a brand is we we're, if i'm approaching the leader of an organization saying we need to rebrand i want to very clearly say we lose operational efficiencies because of this 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 and this so i think making the business case for it and really speaking like i think that the aesthetic and the cosmetic layer is insignificant it's it's really about how is it how is it adding operational efficiencies how is it increasing visibility how is it increasing its appeal to to potential recruits but i think like trying as much as possible to articulate objectives around what the brand should accomplish and as much as possible starting to think about what those metrics could potentially be so to, to move the conversation away from branding and more about the cost of branding and move it more to the opportunities that the branding can potentially afford all right i think we are going to have to wrap it up any closing words rena no again you know thank you dharma for your time ken thank you so much for being a sponsor of our event today and being our moderator awesome job both of you and again i encourage all our participants please consider joining the asian american chamber of commerce so that we can bring you more of these amazing presentations dharma thank you ken thank you for your time today Thanks thank very you. much. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. And, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions or want to talk about any of this further. But, but Ken, Rena, thank you so much as well. And, uh, and everyone who's on the call, thank you for, for taking the time. And uh, everyone have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the contracting committee members for their dedication and support to make AACC garment contracting uh, webinar series possible.